screen. This is another one of our concerts in our Beethoven's 250th birthday celebration featuring world-renowned pianist, Dr. June Penn. We always like to thank our sponsors who make these amazing concerts possible. Our platinum partner, Rogers and Associates. Our silver partner, 1234 Microtechnologies. Our hotel partner, The Holiday Inn. And our media partner, Fine Living Lancaster. And to keep everyone safe here tonight, we ask that masks remain in place during the duration of the performance. And also, please maintain social distance upon exiting the venue this evening. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Dr. Jun Pan. All right, thank you. Thank you all for being here and or in front of the uh, live stream. It's so nice to be back. Happy 2021. I haven't uh, played a concert since uh, November, but I sincerely hope that this year will be a much better year than 2020 for all of us. Um, first of all, I'd like to describe a little bit in the title today says, uh, Lesser Known uh, Sonatas. Why Lesser Known? Well, the, the reason these five sonatas are lesser known only because they're not played very often in the concert. Uh, you, you, you don't hear them very often, but it's also not very true, say, they're all uh, lesser known. The first of two sonatas, uh, both sonatas in Opus 49, they're actually very popular. For the intermediate students, they play them a lot, as a matter of fact. Um, so especially when, when, when you learn the music, I guess, uh, uh, you learn some small music first, then your piece is getting longer and longer. So I guess I, I can probably speak for all the students who have been in this journey that when you get the first sonatina, you think, oh my gosh, how come this piece is so long, right? But sonatina, consider, is a small sonata. So when, when students start to learn sonatinas and these first two sonatas are actually on the same list as, as the sonatinas that they're, they're learning. So they're, by all means, they're just shorter. So uh, both of these sonatas in Opus 49 were composed around 1795 or 1796, about exactly the same time when he was writing his third piano sonata. And if you remember, uh, when I played the uh, Opus 2, which is the very first piano sonatas, that was when Beethoven was still studying with Haydn. Right? And also he dedicated those three sonatas to Joseph Haydn to pay his respect. So these two sonat sonatas are written about in the same time. So I want to just let you know that when you hear these two sonatas, you probably feel, hmm, doesn't feel like it's from Beethoven. You're, you're probably right. A lot of these styles, it sounds like Haydn or Mozart, as a matter of fact. So wait until you, you hear this, you're going to, you, you can adjust uh, your, yourself. So uh, even though they, they were written that early but didn't get published until 10 years later. So from that time, they follow the opus number and uh, the number of the sonatas he wrote, it becomes number 19 and number 20. Uh, and at the beginning, Beethoven didn't even want to publish them. 
because they're the size. Also, he didn't feel like these pieces are uh, as good as the others. Uh, as a matter of fact, that um, his brother, Kasper von Beethoven, uh, against his will, took these two pieces to the publisher said, this is, they are wonderful pieces, they're worth to publish. Um, so even though it's, it's written earlier but published much later, that's why when you listen to these two pieces, the, the style is more like much early classical like Haydn and, and Mozart. Uh, it's the same thing as when he wrote his second piano concerto. Actually, he wrote that first, but because published the second, it becomes second. So, so there, there are some examples like this. And, and Beethoven did refer these two sonata as a light sonata. So because of the, the, the size. And uh, if you look at the program, uh, each sonata contains only two movements. The uh, Opus 49, number one, has Andante and Rondo Allegro. And uh, Opus 49, number two, has the Allegro Monotropo, then followed by a tempo of minuet. So I am actually going to play the second first, followed by the first without stopping, which means you're going to hear four movements with Allegro Monotropo, followed by Tempo Diminuet, then Andante, then followed by Rondo Allegro. That just sounds like a complete four-movement sonata type. And uh, also, uh, a good thing is both of these two pieces are in the key of G. Even though the Opus 49 number one says G minor, as a matter of fact, the second movement is in G major. So, and the entire uh, Opus 49 number two are in G major, so you, you have the entire four movements in the keys of G. And I, when I mentioned that these two sonatas, you're gonna hear a lot of styles of Haydn and Mozart. I give you an example, like uh, Beethoven used a lot of Alberti bass, uh, for the non-musician, the Alberti bass means that took a uh, chord to separate them and play the bass first, then the highest note first, then the middle one back to. So instead of a bro block chord, you'd play. For example, the very famous and. Now you hear a lot of these, these accompaniments, they call uh, Alberti bass accompaniments. So you hear a lot of these things here. And, and uh, so um, also I want to mention one thing that at the end of the second movement of Opus 49 number two, there is one trio So I, I play this trio starting from the upper neighbor note. Uh, this probably is going to be the only one trio that I play for the entire Beethoven cycle. Everything else I start from the main note. I, I play the upper uh, neighbor note to start for this one just to pay respect to Mozart and Haydn. And uh, I truly believe when uh, Beethoven was studying with Haydn, that, that's the trio that he was studying from. So that's, that's the style. So this is the, uh, uh, the only trio that you're gonna hear I'm playing from the upper neighbor note. So from, uh, uh, now I'm gonna perform you both of these sonatas from Opus 49, but number two first, followed by uh, number one, uh, they are actually uh, not very long. So uh, even you, when you look at the program, here it says five sonatas. You go, oh my gosh, I'm going to sit here until uh, midnight. No, actually, as a matter of fact, the 
all these five sonatas add together is not as long as the Hammerklavier sonata. So, so you're not going to sit here very long. So here is the Opus 49, number two, then followed by number one.
So it could be a, a four movement sonata in total, if I'm, I'm not telling you there, there are actually two sonatas. Um, while I was uh, practicing these five works, Yixing was asking me, what's your favorite one among these five? And uh, I said, everyone is my favorite. I, I truly didn't mean that answer her in a cheesy way. <laughs> um, I have to say, before, I, before I, I was doing this project, I had my favorites, I had to say. Um, obviously, those more famous ones, such as Moonlight, a Pasanada, Washtan, you know, you name it, Hamaklavir. But more I learn these works one by one, I really cannot say anymore which one is my favorite. Every single note Beethoven wrote in these works, it's, it's not a waste. Every single one is. Uh, you just heard this, these two sonatas that uh, I don't think normally you, 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 you can say that's from Beethoven, because uh, normally you don't expect this kind of uh, style from Beethoven. Um, but yeah, that's also his. And uh, so the next one I'm going to uh, present you is the sonata number 22 in F major, opus 54. So you're probably going to ask, you just play number 19 and 20, now 22. Where did 21 go? Um, Opus 54 uh, was written in 1804. It is contemporary to the first sketches of his famous uh, symphony number no. 5. That was the one. So, um, and this sonata is absolutely a wonderful masterpiece. But it became one of the Beethoven's lesser known sonata simply because it's overshadowed by its widely known neighbors, the Washtan and the Apa sonata. The Washtan sonata is opus 53, it's number 21. And the Apasionata Sonata is 23, opus 57. So this is one before this and one after that. They both are, are obviously more famous music. And I am going to play these two works, plus uh, his last piece in the middle area, opus 90, on July the 17th, this summer doing the Lancaster International Piano Festival. Uh, that would be back to the Ware Center. Uh, so the Opus 54, um, again, if you look at the program, it seems like missing the first two movements. Um, it starts with a minuet movement and, and a finish by a, a very active rondo uh, movement. So you're probably going to ask, where's the first movement and where's the slow movement? Um, Andrew Schiff, the, one of my favorite pianists, has described this movement as a Portraying beauty and beast, because uh, there 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 are two different um, themes in this one. The 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 one he was calling a beauty, it, it's really a very nice. Now it's not a minuet. It says tempo, the minuetto means it only takes a tempo from minuet, but it's not a minuet. But it's a very lovely melody.
It's really, really nice. Then you hear this piece come in. All these accents for tonos are written in from Beethoven. So you hear <laughs> a very, very lovely uh, melody tune, and all of a sudden, this, this octave comes in. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's a rondo form uh, by using A, B, A, B, A instead of, there's not a C there. Uh, it, just, it just, this octave comes back. Um, but each A part comes back with a variation. So I, I, I have to say Beethoven is such a genius in writing the variations. Uh, he has several wonderful piano variations, including the famous Diabelli uh, variation, also uh, his C minor uh, 32 variations. Uh, on this... Um, May 6th and 7th this year, uh, I'm going to perform the entire uh, piano cello works by Beethoven with cellist Emilio Colon at the Ware Center. Uh, two night in a row, totally eight pieces. That contains five sonatas and three variations. By then, you're going to hear how wonderful that he can write these variations. So for back to this, uh, Movement. It didn't say variation in, in anywhere, but every time when this A part comes back, you hear more and more difference. Uh, he writes uh, from the different rhythms that he's he's doing. He's he's absolutely wonderful to write these kind of thing. Um, the second movement has a lot of running notes, uh, so I was <laughs> thinking of his fam famous pupil, Carl Cherney. That you, everyone know that Cherney wrote more than thousands of different exercises because when he was studying with Beethoven that he felt, oh, you know, it's so difficult to play these sonatas. But, so he took each difficult passage out and write a whole exercise. And, and he thought oh, if people could practice my exercise, then you have a lot easier time when you play the uh, uh, Beethoven sonatas. Um, I was thinking one from, from Cherny, this. So far and so forth, all, all these kind of craziness. And obviously, he was thinking, if you can play this for Beethoven sonata, you're probably going to be very easy for you. Obviously, there's a lot of running uh, exercise. But this second movement, I have to say, it's not simply just running notes. All these running 16th notes, they're extremely lyrical, very much singing, um, and it's always go by conversations. Um, left hand start, finish with an, 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 an sfotando at the last note. And the, the same thing with right hand uh, phrasing. But he add a, a, a note in the end, then left hand answers in Then right hand. So all these kind of um, surprising at the end. But everything else, all these 16th notes are extremely singing and lyrical. Uh, so uh, the second movement starts with a legretto. You see that. And, uh, but um, he took a pure allegro at the very end. Uh, Basically, you just need to play as 
fast as you can. <laughs> I, I see what, what I can do. OK, so I'm going to present you again. This is a, a two movement sonata, opus 54.
Fun, a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, so the fourth one for tonight. Um, again, it's still in two movements. Um, this sonata number 24 in F sharp major. Opus 78 was composed in 1809. Um, the first movement, Adagio Cantabile, followed by Allegro Monotropo. It's, it's a lovely movement uh, with a lot of singing. According to Carl Cherney, Beethoven himself singled out this sonata and uh, the one right before this, the Appassionata Sonata, as his favorites. Of course, once written, the Hammerklavier Sonata also became Beethoven's uh, favorite. So you can see why uh, Beethoven likes that so much. It's a very special one. First of all, it's in the key of F sharp major. Uh, that means there are six sharps. Um, it's very difficult even today when we play on the, on the piano like this. Uh, imagine when back to Beethoven's time. His, his piano is much uh, smaller than, than ours. It's even harder. Um, this movement reminds me a lot of the so-called famous Moonlight Sonata. Uh, it, it, that's how beautiful I, 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 I truly feel this, this piece is, but I think this movement is a lot more mature than when Beethoven wrote the Moonlight. The second movement, it's a Allegro Vivace, a very fast, uh, fun, like, like normal last movement is supposed to be. Um, in the first two sonatas I played today, I mentioned that Beethoven actually learned a lot from Haydn and Mozart's, that I give you a, a, one example of the Alberti bass, but among tonight's five sonatas, you hear a lot of two-note slur. That's a very typical 
style by the early classicals, most likely by, by Haydn and, and, and Mozart. Uh, but, but you're also going to hear a lot from tonight's sonatas by, by Beethoven. But certainly these two note slurs would not make you to feel like, oh, this is Mozart or, or Haydn. You, you're still going to truly think, oh, this is Beethoven, especially from a very dramatic uh, major and minor key change, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, I, I give you one example. So this is in F sharp major. It's a totally major key. Immediately, then you feel. Then the major comes back. Then the minor comes back. Just back and forth. So that gives you. It doesn't give you a break. That you think one surprise, then the next one comes. Um, so it's. You you can still tell this is definitely. Uh, Beethoven, not, not others. So here now I'm going to play you the sonata number 24 uh, in F sharp major, opus 78. Again, this is a, a two movement sonata.
Thank you. <clears throat> so here comes the last one for tonight. Uh, the only one has three movements uh, for this evening's uh, five sonatas. This is sonata number 25 in G major. So tonight we start with G major and we're going to finish in G major. Uh, this is Opus 79. Uh, was written in 1809. Uh, pretty much in the same year as the one I just played for you. Uh, it's alternatively titled Cuckoo, or a sonatina, and it is notable for its shortness. The first movement starts in G major, but surprisingly, the development all of a sudden goes to a big surprise key in E major. The second movement is in G minor, and what a, a beautiful movement that is. Um, some scholars, critics, that 
thinks that this second movement is a boat song or Venetian boat song, whatever you call that, Barcaro or something. Um, I, I really don't think so. Beethoven was never been in Venice. Doesn't mean that he cannot write a Venetian boat song if you, you know he was never been there. But uh, even back then, I don't think the uh, Venetian boat song was that popular yet. Uh, the reason people say that just because later Mendelssohn wrote several Venetian boat songs in a very similar style. E even the melody line, it's very similar with this second movement. But if you remember what I mentioned in my previous lectures, that how Beethoven influences his later composers that we have talked about, he how he influenced Chopin, Schubert, and I truly believe this is another one, that the reason that Mendelssohn wrote such beautiful Venetian boat song later, it has a big influence from uh, Beethoven. So this movement, uh, even though it's not a, a boat song, but I chose to play this a little bit faster than most of the pianists, just simply that's, I believe, because it's, it's Mark Andante. It's not Adagio for that. And the final movements, it's one of the most playful and shortest so far. It's only about two minutes long. Uh, the movement constructed in rondo form, it's A, B, A, C, A, plus A coda. Um, a very brief coda brings this quick, lighthearted uh, sonata to a brisk end. So it's a, 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 a big, fun piece. Um, Beethoven later uses the chord progression found in the beginning of the A section in this movement to start his sonata number 30, Opus 109. So you already can see that there, there are connections even from this uh, to his late works. A comparison of two pieces gives a dramatic illustration of how Beethoven's piano writing developed in 11 years that intervened between the two sonatas. Um, so I am going to perform the Opus 109 with Opus 110 and Opus 111, the last three sonatas, uh, to end this cycle, this series, in November this year. So here's the last piece of tonight. Um, sonata in G major, uh, Opus 79. 